Alrighty, the last learning outcome that we're going to look at for cognitive is number 12. Evaluate one theory, so we're evaluating it, the strengths and limitations, of how emotion may affect one cognitive process. What cognitive process do you guys think we're going to be doing? Memory! So we're going to be dealing with flashbulb memory. Okay, the theory that strongly emotional events give us a super sensitive memory of that event. Okay, so the basics. What is flashbulb memory? Flashbulb memory, um, the theory of flashbulb memory, was suggested in 1977 by two researchers named Brown and Kulik. And they said that flashbulb memory is a special type of emotional memory which refers to vivid and detailed memories of highly emotional events that appear to be recorded in the brain as though with the help of a camera's flash. So literally, if you think about this, you think of a flashbulb, think about a maybe exciting or traumatic emotional event, and it's almost lit up by the flash of a camera. It, it, some people say they remember it almost in slow motion and they remember every little detail that happened when that thing was happening. Um, and Brown and Kulik suggested when they were presenting their research that maybe there's a special neural mechanism that triggers an emotional arousal because an event is expected or extremely important. So when something really unexpected or extremely important happens, something triggers in your brain and you become very emotionally aroused and you tend to remember it better. So, I mean, if you guys had to guess... You know, can you think of a mechanism in our brain that's associated with strong emotional memories? Overall, um, remember that this is all taken from your book, from the Crane and Hannibal textbook, um, on page 91 and 92. So this is just kind of reiterating that stuff. All right, so because the, lear the command term is uh, evaluate, we're going to go over the strengths and the limitations of the theory of flashbulb memory as proposed by Brown and Kulik. So the strengths are kind of popular um, just simply because so many people believe that this type of thing is true and that it's happened to them. A lot of us feel like we've experienced it, okay? So the, the strengths being basically most people think they've experienced uh, a time when they had a flashbulb memory. When Brown and Kulik did their studies, um, they found that uh, in one study, they found that over 90% of their participants said that they had flashbulb memories associated with a personal, personal shock, such as the sudden death of a close relative. Um, so Brown and Kulik did a lot of research um, with historical events like the assassination of JFK, Martin Luther King, or Robert Kennedy. Um, they also found in their research that, per that participants recalled the assassination of, of JFK kind of as one of the biggest memories of their lives. Um, so again, like I said, over 90% of people um, in one of their studies, probably from around 1977, it was 73 out of 80 people said that they had experienced flashbulb memories, that they had experienced this thing where they felt like their memory was lit up by a flash and they just remember every little detail about that moment. Another thing that supports the theory of flashbulb memory is the fact that the amygdala exists. And throughout the years, um, we've been doing more research, and uh, researchers have found that you know the amygdala is responsible for storing, to a certain extent, strong emotional memories. You guys think back to Clive Waring and loving his wife and things like that. Um, fear, right? When we think about seeing a spider or something, what's you know activating? It's the amygdala. So in a way, you know, this kind of backs up what Brown and Kulik said about a special neural mechanism, even though they suggested that theory before there was a lot of research on the amygdala. So it was kind of like this research on the amygdala backs up what they thought. Um, on the flip side, there's actually a lot more research, um, as boring as that is, that, that totally kind of debunks this theory as not really being true. Um, so starting off with somebody called Neiser in 1982, Neiser says that flashbulb memories are simply narratives or stories, right? They're, they're conventions of storytelling, that they're governed, that, that flashbulb memories are governed by storytelling schemas that are influenced by the telling and retelling of memories after an event. 
And so as you guys can, can imagine, when something happens, you know, September 30th um, in Ecuador, 9-11 um, in the United States, people talk about it. People talk about it a lot. You, t you say where you were and what you were doing when it happened. You hear other stories about what they were doing when, when it happened. You hear the news telling stories about what people were doing when it happened. And you get all these stories being told over and over and over again. And what Neiser says is that, you know, this rehearsal, this constant repetition of the stories, it contributes to the fact that a lot of people are really confident about their memories about strongly emotional events. But although they're actually really confident, research has found that they're not necessarily ac any more accurate than, than any other memory. Um, so in a 1992 study uh, conducted by Neiser and Harsh, they investigated people's memories of the Challenger explosion. That was the space shuttle that went up into the air and exploded in front of everyone's eyes. Um, and on board was a teacher, an elementary school teacher named Christine McAuliffe. And I remember that because I remember this accident. Um, a lot of school children were watching it. It was the first you know, teacher to go up into space, and everyone was really excited. Um, but it exploded in front of everyone's faces, basically, within a few seconds um, after takeoff. So it was really traumatic. And Neiser and Harsh did a study, and they interviewed people 24 hours after the explosion and then two years after the explosion. Although people were really confident in their memories and the accuracy of their memories, 40% of participants had distorted memories. So again, you might ask why, and think about how many times they told the story, kind of like serial reproduction. You could, you could um, refer this possibly back to Bartlett a little bit, um, you know, telling the story of the War of the Ghosts, and, and when you tell it and retell it and retell it, you might start to make it easier to remember or take other details into your brain from news stories or things like that. Other studies that, uh, that don't support the flashbulb memory would be Tallarico and Rubin. They found that the more emotional the memory, the more confidence there is, but not accuracy. So kind of summarizing what everyone else said, but kind of putting it concisely. Also in your Crane and Hannibal book, um, current attitudes can also affect memories. And we can remember this back, we can kind of um, connect this back to the Kahneman studies, right? Experiencing self versus the remembering self. Um, and a specific study to back that up would be Breckler in 1994 found that people's current attitude about blood donation affects their memories of donating in the past. So even if they didn't like donating blood in the past, you know, if they've been seeing lots of signs about how it supports people and saves people's lives, they might not remember the bad stuff as much. Um, and I do this every day when I think about Mexico City. I have a, a current, my current attitude about Mexico City is very positive and I love it, but I seem to forget how bad the traffic was and the mean taxi drivers and stuff like that. So we definitely have selective memory of the past depending on our current attitudes about something. Take a little moment to think about how your current attitudes about something might also affect it. Think about boyfriends and girlfriends, right? If you broke up with someone, you had a bad breakup, and you think of them badly now, you probably look back on your relationship as kind of negative. Um, and so that's something to think about as well. Um, lastly, in um, a study done by McCloskey et al. Uh, by John, at John Hopkins University, they also found that a lot of the research in support of flashbulb memories, so most of Brown and Kulik's um, research, is based on yes or no questions. So they actually were asking people, do you remember what you were doing when this happened? And then if the person says yes, then basically they're saying, wow, yes, this person has flashbulb memory because they said yes, they remember what they were doing. Um, and of course, they also had to include at least one detail about where they were, what they were doing, who told them, and how they felt or how other people felt while this, while this event happened or in the aftermath of the event. So basically, if they said yes to remembering an event, and then they gave one detail about what they were doing or what, where they were, then that was enough for Brown and Kulik to say, yes, this person has flashbulb memory. So if you actually think about it, the evidence is not really that strong, okay? So this is pretty straightforward. What I'm gonna do is go to the next slide. Basically, it's just time to think about the implications, a little bit of critical thinking here, okay? So what are some further questions we can ask? You know, what does it take, for example, for someone's neural mechanism to get triggered, right? How do we know how surprising or emotional an event has to be to, quote, trigger this emotional memory that Brown and Kulik are talking about? So that's a big question that a lot of people have, you know, to kind of um, back up the science behind it. Um, 
you know, even though a lot of the research says that we don't have it, well then what explains the fact that we feel like we get them? You know, you, I'm sure all of you can think of a traumatic moment or a really exciting moment where you feel like you can relive it and all the details. You might remember the smell, the sights, whatever. Um, you know, what accounts for all of us feeling like that happened? Is it simply the, the narrative, the storytelling convention that we just, we go over it so much that we have this false sense of confidence about how well we remember it? So that's a question to ask as well. And then lastly, obviously this brings up a connection with TOK a little bit and, and our own subjective experiences of emotion, right? Um, you know, kind of like what we said with loftus and repressed memories, some people don't even realize that something is traumatic. And then they find out later on that it was bad and, you know, maybe in cases of child abuse or things like that. Um, you know, how do we know if something is bad and how do we know if everyone is going to get the same type of memory of that event or the same attitude or perspective on that event. So again, some things to think about, um, and any of these critical thinking questions would probably uh, look good in an essay to show that you're critically thinking and making connections. So overall, going back to the learning outcome, evaluating one theory of how emotion may affect one cognitive process, we're going to look at emotion in general, um, sadness, happiness, um, and how that affects our memory. And basically that theory that explains that is called the flashbulb memory.